With me for the course of our show tonight is my amazing panel. Very excited to have journalist and broadcaster, former boss of TalkSport Radio, Mike Parry, psychotherapist and broadcaster, Lucy Beresford, and political commentator, Bill Bocat. Folks, great to have you on the show. Bill, if I could start with you. First of all, your reaction to this story about a young footballer who's being investigated by the FA for a tweet that he sent on social media when he was 14 years of age. Yeah, it, I think it's absolutely disgraceful. I mean, from personal experience, from when I was in year nine uh, in secondary school, when I was 14 years old, I remember when the word gay was just being used, you know, regularly by fellow classmates and colleagues to describe people who used to do drama club after school or, or used to do activities in which they feel would be feminine. And I feel with what this uh, decision by the FA, I think it's really damaging uh, for, for Mark Boland, who, uh, for, for, for this particular player, yeah. because he's such a talented individual and he's had such a promising start, played every game so far of this championship season. And I can't imagine the, the, the mental health effect it would have on him when also, I think for him, it should be for his own sake for, to reflect on what he has done. And obviously it was, it was a distasteful tweet nonetheless, but I yeah. feel that the FA have got their priorities wrong here. Well, that's right. I think we can obviously condemn the sentiment uh, of what he wrote. But Lucy, two things. He was 14 years of age. And also, uh, why don't apologies work anymore? Uh, that's a really extraordinary thing, isn't it? I mean, the thing about the adolescent brain is that it is still growing and it grows in such a way that parts of the brain that really uh, allow us to think about risk or to evaluate, you know, the consequences of our actions are actually reduced to enable other parts of the brain to develop more cogently. And so the chances are, I mean, this is the worry about social media. There's nothing arguably more dangerous in the world than a 14 year old boy and a mobile phone. And <laughs> he has now proved that some of the things that you do there will come back to haunt you. But as you point out, the bottom line is, should what he wrote when he was 14 be held against him when nine years later, he is a very different person. We are all so different those years in adolescence, if we were all tortured by the things that we did. And of course, you know, some of us on this sofa are old enough to have not needed to worry about social media. Speak uh, yourself, you know, please. Uh, yeah, well, OK, yes, it's <laughs> just me then. Uh, so, you know, maybe things I said behind the bike sheds mm -hmm. uh, would then gain currency around the playground, but they didn't get a global audience in the way that this poor lad's... Lucy, I I'll done. take your word for it that you were only talking behind the bike sheds. Mm. <laughs> Mike yeah. Harry, um, yeah, um, you, you held a very senior role at the FA. Yes. So, uh, so you know the organisation intimately well. What's yes. your reaction to this? Um, I, I'm absolutely perplexed as to why they would bother going back and, and dealing with this. Um, just to endorse the point that Lucy's just made, not only is this a vastly different person nine years on, it's a completely different person. This lad, Mark Bowler, he went, he, he went through the Academy Youth uh, Scheme at Arsenal, OK? Now, you know, football, generally speaking, changes a boy when they take him out of the school playground, put him through the Academy Youth System, and he ends up as a professional footballer. You are radically changed. You're a different person at the end of that process, and particularly at Arsenal. The standard at Arsenal are immensely high, yeah. and the behaviour of their players is, is, you know, checked upon constantly. They're reminded you've got that logo on your shirt, the, the gunners, you know, you've got the, the, the gun there, and you must love it to the standards of the club. So I think it's utterly ridiculous. It poses a few questions. First of all, who at the FA decided FA rule E31 uh, had been violated and the boy was guilty of, or could be guilty, allegedly, of a great uh, aggravated misconduct? It's not aggravated misconduct when you're 14 years of age and you're putting out silly messages. You're not trying to, you know, be badly behaved and aggravate people. You're having a laugh and a shout because that's what you think it is in those days, distasteful as it was. But to go back all that time, and I'd like to know, second question is, hmm. who found it? And why was it found? Yeah, who's trying and, 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 exactly. and why was it brought to the attention of the football authorities now? The very best thing that the football authorities could have done was to go and see the lad, you know, he's not a lad anymore, is he? 23-year-old uh, yeah. professional footballer, played at every game this season for Middlesbrough, 
They should have gone and seen him and said, could you sit down? I want to have a word with you. Look, you might not remember this and then show him this message from nine years ago, but do you agree that it was distasteful? And should have, Absolutely. I bet he can't even remember putting it out. Mm. So it should have been done behind closed doors, in private. The boy told that, you know, obviously, we wouldn't want you to repeat this, and him saying... That's not me anymore. Do you think That's they saw me. what happened with the MCC and the England cricketer who yeah. was similarly... Ollie Robinson. Yeah, so Ollie Robinson's yeah. tweets, who was, again, similarly found, like, ten years yes. prior to the event. Yes. And the FA thought, oh, my goodness, we can't be caught No, napping. no, I don't, th I don't think so. I think what you'll find is there are people in society who go looking for this sort of thing, OK? Looking for trouble, looking to trip people up, looking to bring people down. And I'm certain that's what's happened in this case. It could even, believe it or not, have been a fan of a, a rival club to Middlesbrough, you know, who mm. just decided, you know, yeah. oh, look, I've seen this, somebody tipped me well, off about it. That's merely speculation. Though, it, it, it's no good, well, well how, how else could it have come to light? I, I, I don't understand it. Unless the FA have got a team of people now inside their headquarters and, you know, up at Wembley Stadium who are spending the day trawling through every professional footballer's list of tweets going back over a decade, how could they possibly else have found it? Somebody must have tipped them off about well, it. Well, Bill, I, I agree with you, Mike. And, Bill, I, I just think that actually 14 or 40, mm -hmm. if you've done something online that was a mistake, you ought to be able to apologise. And as long as that apology is sincere mm. and the mistake is not repeated, you should be forgiven. You shouldn't lose your career. Definitely. And I was christened a Catholic. And one of the things that we believe mm. in Catholicism is the... Um, is the idea of confession and absolutely I think with the woke mob that has gone against this young talented football player um, I think that they need a lesson a little bit in mercy uh, and I do believe in the idea of redemption with Ollie Robinson for instance and you could just see how you know despondent he was when he gave that press conference you know apologizing for his past remarks but now just seeing how brilliantly he's been doing uh, in test matches against india so i feel that we need to direct our focus and with the fa as well i think following on from what mike has said i think and, and what i said previously their 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 attentions in completely the wrong area why don't they focus on manchester city for instance who allowed a player like uh, Benjamin Mendy, the, the, the French defender, to still train and even play when he was still being investigated uh, for charges of sexual assault. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Yes, well, I do agree with you all on that one. Lucy, can I ask you about why the government is going to uh, push ahead with vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds after the JCVI, who advised the government on immunisations, have said that it's not a move that they would recommend? The government, I think, are incredibly nervous about what's going to happen when schools in England go back. They've already seen what has happened in Scotland. There has been an uptick in the number of cases. And the idea that there are other countries in Europe in particular who have already been vaccinating uh, children who are over 12. The idea that we can't do that, particularly when we were so far ahead in our vaccination programme compared to those other countries. I think what's coming together is this fear that if we don't actually inoculate that particular cohort uh, as quickly as possible, and there are rumours that actually this will be actually turned over probably by next Tuesday, maybe next Wednesday, that actually there is a fear that there's going to be a bigger spike now that kids are going back to school. That's going to have an impact on the elderly members of the community, because obviously children have grandparents, aunts and uncles that they may infect. Um, and the government, I think, just want to be seen to be doing as much as they can because they were so on the front foot at the beginning of this vaccination programme. And unfortunately, that has now stalled. Bill? Um, I feel like I disagree with that issue. I think with the JVCI, they were following the science. And I think one thing to point out with their decision is they're not necessarily saying that children getting a vac vaccine, those aged 12 to 15, uh, is dangerous, even though there's been a small number of cases uh, of children who have had um, heart pro uh, is is issues with um, heart problems. With yeah, it. myocarditis, for yes, example. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but they're not necessarily saying that. They actually say that the benefits of children being vaccinated are at risk. What they're saying is, is that the actual benefits for this age cohort to get vaccinated um, in our uh, 
mission against COVID-19 mm. is marginal. And, and the JVCR made it clear. Andrew Pollard thinks that we shouldn't particularly be vaccinating children and any spares that we have. And we do have a lot of spares. Just look at the fact that we've donated four million vaccines to Australia um, is we need to look at uh, Areas of the, of the world, for instance, that aren't vaccinated, like Africa, for instance, because the pandemic is not an issue that's unique to Britain. It's a global problem. And if we're talking about the idea of global Britain, as Boris Johnson has been repeatedly saying, then, then maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's the way in which we can go forward. Briefly, Mike Parry? Well, I think charity starts at home with this one and the vaccines have to be, you know, delivered to people in this country first. Of course, I want to help the rest of the world. But I think all children between 12 and 15 should be vaccinated because then we can get rid of the ridiculous situation where one kid turns up at school with COVID and they close the school or they send the whole class home. It's not good enough. Children also carry it. They can infect teachers. They can then go back home. They can infect their parents and their grandparents. So if there is a benefit and James VCI have said there is a mild benefit in vaccinating the children, then we should vaccinate them and get rid of all doubt. Lucy, Bill and Mike are with me for the course of the programme and we've got tomorrow's front pages coming in very shortly. You'll get their reaction with me still, as you've just heard from him, Mike Parry, broadcaster, journalist, founder of TalkSport Radio, psychotherapist and broadcaster Lucy Beresford and political commentator Bill Boquet. Now let's get to our first story. This year's triple lock on pensions could be scrapped as soon as next week. Chancellor Rishi Sunak is widely expected to axe or water down the Tory manifesto pledge to prevent pensions rising by 8% next April. This may mean that many will have to find other sources of income to fill the gap. Are we leaving our ageing population penniless? Here's what Sunak had to say. A triple lock is the uh, government's policy, but I very much recognise people's concerns. What I would say is the numbers that you, you mentioned at this point are speculation because we haven't actually got them yet. That happens later on. But I do recognise people's concerns on this. I think they are completely legitimate and fair concerns to raise. And what I would say when we look at this properly at the appropriate time, that your word is the right word, fairness. That will be absolutely driving what we do. And we want to make sure that the decisions we make and the systems we have are fair, both for pensioners and for taxpayers. So, uh, Lucy, what do you think? Are pensioners getting a bit of a clobbering here? Not really. They've actually had it good for a very long time. And we need to remember there are plenty of people of working age who've either lost their job or they're on furlough, or if they're in the public sector, they've had a complete wage freeze. Mm -hmm. So these ideas that somehow there needs to be that cohort of person actually protected, it's, it's actually been in place since George Osborne was chancellor. And they came up with this triple lock idea, actually never imagining that wages would rise mm. as rapidly as they have done in the last 15 months. And of course, that's a rather sort of COVID specific scenario. But I think people recognise that when the facts change and when issues change, then you're entitled to change your mind. So even though this was a manifesto pledge, even though this is the kind of thing that the Tories are known for, I think by and large, people are going to recognise that they, they will, if they, if they do actually follow through and uh, dilute the triple lock, that they'll be doing it for a very valid reason. Uh, the triple lock isn't about fairness, is it, Bill? It's about preserving votes in Middle England. It's not just about preserving votes, but it's just simply paying off the monumental amount of debt caused by the pandemic uh, and specifically a, a scheme as humongous as furlough, which is mm. it's cost over £67 billion. And now the government are in this weird predicament where they have to think, well, where is this money coming from? Mm. Uh, and, and obviously the triple lock is one area, mm. uh, which pensioners are not happy about in the slightest, but also with a potential rise in national insurance contributions. And yeah. you, this is the Conservative Party we're talking about. And the Conservative Party stand up for free market principles and low taxes. And I feel that with this, they're taking some of their, and I like to, we like to say a lot with Labour voters, but traditional voters for granted. And we don't want a situation where, with Cheshire and Amish, you start seeing 
uh, Tory safe seats suddenly lose because yeah. of policies like these. But the money has to come from somewhere. Pensioners have been working their whole lives, Mike, yeah. paid into the system. Why should sure. they be clobbered like this? Well, just to emphasise the point that Lucy made, we've had it very good. Now, I am of pensionable age. I could draw a pension. I would frankly hold my hands up and say 8%, no thanks. I'd feel greedy. I'm taking too much money out of society because actually I went through a golden age. I got a pension paid for me when I was in work in Fleet Street, OK? Right. I had the opportunity to buy a house for £20,000 when I was 23 years of age. Mm. I've been very lucky in my life and I don't want to take any more money out of the country now. I want to pass it down the system and give the younger people in this country the benefits. I would say that the rise in pensions, if there's any rise at all, mm. I think there should be a case for saying there shouldn't be one this year because of extraordinary circumstances, but sh certainly nothing more than inflation. Um, and certainly not up to 8% to match the extraordinary rise in, in earnings. Um, what about the elephant in the room, which is to raise income tax? Because many people are concerned that reneging on the triple lock clobbers pensioners, yeah. uh, and that was a sort of promise made by the Conservatives, and it did secure votes in Middle England. Mm. Uh, then you've got national insurance contributions yeah, it, rising, but... which affects uh, young people and the poor. Yeah. Uh, so, so why don't we just raise taxes? Well, well I, I've got a theory, and that is that I think think we'd be in a better healthy economic state mm. if we lowered taxes. Mm. I believe in growth yeah. and yeah. growth comes about in my view by lowering taxes. Mm. You mentioned George Osborne a minute ago, uh, Lucy. George Osborne destroyed the property market in this country yeah. and managed to... Um, th th the amount of money we'll be getting in stamp duty, right, was, was brilliant when it was down to like one, one and a half cent, two percent. Yeah. The minute George Osborne decided Oh, there's so many rich people overseas buying big property here. I'll whip that right up to 5%. Some people are paying half a million pounds in stamp duty. Yeah. What happened? Revenues sunk like that. And that's what happens when you put taxes up. Revenues go down. I would advise the government to lower taxes. But it's yeah. not, what it's happens. Not, it's not. And also, it isn't just about that. It's about how do you differentiate yourself. If you're a Tory, if you're the Conservatives or you're Labour, if you're then going to turn the Tory party into a high-tax yeah. uh, no party, difference. then there will be no difference. Historically, we have always been... Uh, the Conservatives have wanted to be a low-tax party. Mm. Perhaps far better is to actually broaden the appeal of national insurance contributions. So at the moment, yes, they are just paid largely by younger workers. Mm. Why not get pensioners to pay national insurance yeah, but then contributions they're already as well? Off by this triple lock at the same time. Yeah. I think the area we need to be looking at, and Dominic Cummings actually made a very good point to this in mm. his most recent newsletter. That's a rare thing. Uh, I know, very mm. much so. Is, Is it uh, a leap year? What's happened? I know. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, Cummings said that uh, specifically at Boris when it comes to national insurance contributions, that why doesn't the government just review how much it's spending on projects, which, frankly, it doesn't need to, like, for instance, HS2, which yeah. Cummings has been strongly strongly against. So mm. I feel maybe there's other areas uh, that the Conservatives can be looking at, because I really feel, and, and I think Katie Ball said in her column in the eye, um, that potentially they might, uh, they might be forgiven by uh, older voters for, for this move, but... Um, they really need to go back to the heart of what they stand for and also the impact that it could have come next election. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's a dilemma with tax, Lucy, because Mike raises a good point that actually if you lower tax, that sort of stimulates the economy. People have got more money Beauty. to spend. Mm. Businesses have got money to hire people. Yeah. Uh, and actually, there is clear evidence that if you lower corporation tax, the receipts actually yes. increase. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but the issue you've got is the unprecedented debt, because not only do we have £2.1 trillion pounds worth of debt, which is almost 100% of the, the actual size of GDP in this country, mm. um, that's going to continue for a while. I mean, the borrowing is going to be with us for years to come, because we still have a deficit, which means that we're spending more than comes in. And that's anticipated to run for the next few years. So again, you need to make sure that you get those tax receipts in. And that's the problem, that if you raise the taxes, um, partly you, you sometimes price people out of the employment market, but also you make it 
more compelling for certain people to be, uh, let's say, tax avoidant. There are you know, very legitimate schemes that accountants help their clients to uh, effect. Mm -hmm. but yeah. what, and, so, and therefore, what that means is that actually your net receipts are reduced. So again, it, all of that, and it makes, it also makes your country, if you, particularly if you have a low corporation tax, it makes your country really attractive for inward well, investment. I think it's a brilliant question, to tax or not to tax? Yeah. That is the question posed <laughs> by my panel. G Many of you are not having electric cars. David has emailed in, it was the government that persuaded me to buy a diesel car. I bought a Jag, not cheap. I'm now a pensioner on the old state pension. £137.60 a week. How can I ever afford an electric car? David, thanks very much for your email. With me until midnight, broadcaster and journalist Mike Parry, psychotherapist and presenter Lucy Beresford, and political commentator Bill Boquet. So, brilliant panel and some great stories for you as well. Let's get to our first one, and this is quite a concerning story, I have to say. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that people's personal debt has grown hugely. And we'll get to that shortly. But first, let's take a look at the front page of The Independent. Number 10, plan to sideline Sturgeon at climate event, a growing rift between Edinburgh and London when it comes to uh, environmental talks. And rebels fight to hold Taliban at bay, a rather distressing photograph. Uh, of uh, what appears to be an ensuing civil war in Afghanistan. Uh, our next front page, where should we go? Sunday Telegraph. Now, the Telegraph are saying Tories at war over idiotic tax increase, a huge battle within the cabinet over whether or not to raise national insurance contributions. Just how do we pay for social care and for the pandemic? That will be a hot political topic for a long time to come. So there you go. Those are the big stories. We'll get to more front pages. But this is quite a shocking statistic. Apparently, a whopping one in eight shoppers are using online buy now, pay later schemes, and they've been chased by debt collectors. Research has revealed that users of the increasingly popular credit repayment plan were charged, charged sorry, £39 million in late fees over the last year. So what do we think? Is buy now, pay later really worth it? I mean, this is just opportunism, isn't it, Mike Parry? Well, I, I don't see why there's outrage at this. If mm. you owe people money and you don't pay it to them on time, then of course you've got to pay interest on it or you've got to be fined uh, or you've got to be given some incentive to pay your debts. Mm. We all knew that, you know, from 50 years ago when the first credit cards came out in this country, mm. it was going to be live now, pay later. Yeah. And everybody said the apocalypse will happen because eventually it all crashed down. Mm. But it, it never has crashed down. Mm. We do all live now and pay later. An awful lot of people pay off their credit card bills in full every month, those who can, you know, and those who don't just have to live on increasing it month by month. But the economic system has not collapsed. It's now inherently a part of uh, the way we all live. And I don't get it that people are moaning about, oh, you know, I've been charged, uh, you know, a fine or I've had to pay interest because I didn't pay my debt Although on I time. Although I wanted, Mike, and I do hear what you're saying, we yeah. could all take responsibility for any debt that we take out. But yes. I think some of these schemes are very tempting because they make it look easy. They just, mm. you know, if you're doing an online purchase, click on this box, yeah. give us your postcode and your name, bang, the money's yours, you know. So I think it's quite seductive how it's done. Yeah, yes, but it, you've still and got devious. the opportunity to say no. Mm. It, it might be devious, but I mean, that, that's just a sales pitch, isn't it? You know, and mm. that's, that comes into every form of life, buying a new car or anything else. The salesman's going to try and make it look very attractive to you and as painless as possible. And of course, it's, it, it's very painful when they, the bills start coming in each month and all that. But I'm sorry... I, I, I subscribe to the old Mrs Thatcher um, virtue, mm. which is, you know, if you, um, if you earn as much as you spend, then you've got yeah. joy and a good life. If yeah. you spend more than you earn, you've got a bad life. That's just a, a basic economic principle. And if there's an item that you want and you can't afford it, you don't buy it. Uh, some people live by that today. Some people say, if I haven't got it in my post office account, uh, yeah. look what I'm talking about, uh, then I... Then I yeah, exactly. Still got a post office by account. the way, it's, yeah. it's good, yeah. to know, good to know where Parry keeps his money. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was under the mattress, by the way. Right. But if I can't go and draw it out of my post office account, pay it over the counter, then I don't buy it. You're absolutely you're right. You're sure you're not going to be another Ken Dodd, I hope not. <laughs>
Um, I mean, Lucy, yeah. I mean, there is, there is considerable research that suggests that young people who don't really understand debt are being focused on by these companies, that they're being manipulated into buying things like fashion wear slowly. Yeah, I think there's a real case for teaching financial management in schools because mm -hmm. I don't think people really understand things like interest rates, they don't understand about debt, they don't understand that very basic principle about how much money have I got coming in, how much money have I got going out. This is the kind of thing that we all hope to learn when we get given pocket money. Mm -hmm. You know, you get given a tiny bit of money and you want that sweetie and you can't afford it. But the problem with these credit cards is they are giving you that illusion that you can have something without necessarily having to pay for it. You don't see the money going out. Do you remember the old days where you had to write a check even that felt yeah. quite sort of brave oh, but now you don't know what I mm. <laughs> oh i'm so old mm. um but the the idea that now people just don't even see that money going out of their account yeah. i think we fundamentally need to go back to some very basic principles about things like interest rates and mm. this is what people need to be taught at school but you're right they're very seductive because they don't actually tell these consumers that actually they might actually incur debt collection and that they may have this awful credit rating at the end of it and it has it's, it's actually... not obvious to anybody, it's not obvious to no, anybody. you spend somebody else's money and think oh this can go on forever Funny surely enough, somebody's going to come knocking on your door and say give it me back who were academically really well qualified right. they had no idea how to use money yeah. they just I, I think money is something that some people have a real mental block about well touch cards for instance i mean mm. you just, they're going to put it up to 100 pounds that really scares they, me no? i'm quite right? happy with yeah. it being bang, 25 yeah, bang, bang, bang. why can't we have a situation where we decide what that limit is on my own credit card i want to be able to say mm. i don't want anybody spending more than 30 pounds on my own credit card thank you very much yeah so little things like that where you can feel actually in control of your own money but this is not the way, and I think the problem is we've become so disconnected from actual cash. We actually don't think about the value of the money that we've got, mm. that actually this is why these companies are able to make a killing. Yeah, Bill, uh, what do you think about this? Because some would say that these businesses are actually, you know, providing credit to people, many of whom who need it, actually. Uh, so, I mean, would you, do you, you know, would you consider government action to be the way forward, or, or would that sort of punish poor people even more? Well, there have been calls for greater regulation um, into these um, pay later schemes that have been going around with uh, companies like Klarna, for instance. But frankly, you won't see me with one of those. I'm very, I hope I'm very responsible when it comes to my money and know how much I've got in my account. I can see the appeal for something like this, especially if you have to buy something in paydays literally just mm. around the corner. Mm. But the, the problem I have is not really to do with more regulation and the state intervening, but there just has to be a greater understanding um, of these schemes and the threats that they can pose, especially for young people who I know use these schemes. And they're incredibly popular, but because that you're now having to pay for so much debt, that they're now riding on, yeah. um, it's going to ruin your credit score. And young people have already had a bad enough case as it is when it comes to um, obviously renting yeah. and in my case having to pay for university tuition fees as well. And like like the, the, the two have mentioned, is we never got taught in school how to set up a bank account yeah. or a mortgage or anything like it's that. It's not difficult though, is it? Well, I think it's convenient it for me in the sense that people. Yeah. I think in my sense, I'm lucky in that my stepfather's accountant, so I have some really good advice. Yeah. But for me, getting a debit card was just totally new for me mm. and um, mm. there needs to be a greater understanding and a lot of it is done on quick purchases well, like yeah, clothing, and sometimes instance, young people can, can destroy yeah. their credit history in, in a short few months yeah. and, and that will you know possibly prevent them from getting a mortgage in years to come that is a concern but mm. I do take Mike Parry's point about personal responsibility um, ages still with me broadcaster and journalist uh, founder and former chief of Talk Sport Radio, Mike Parry, psychotherapist and presenter Lucy Beresford and political commentator Bill Boquette. So let's get to our next story. And this is all about China. The fact that China are going to war with scandal hit celebrities who it deems social tumours as part of a profound revolution across the business, financial and culture sectors, according to state media. Experts say that President Xi Jinping is launching an attack on post-Mao liberalization, which along with capitalist free markets, opened people up to Western influences, a celebrity culture 
which promotes individualism rather than collectivism. From the economic realm, the financial sector to the cultural circle and to the political field, a profound transformation or a profound revolution is taking place. This according to a nationalist blogger. So deeply concerning, isn't it, Bill? Just the idea that what may soon be the world's biggest economic superpower is taking down its celebrities. It is, and it's been obviously suppressing uh, dissenters for many years, as we know, and China has exerted like almost total influence in various different ways in the West, and it's been ongoing for a long time. But it's really interesting that what we're seeing now with um, these celebrities and also a lot of young people uh, in China it is this post-Maoist liberalisation. Uh, like, you, like you mentioned, they've been exposed to Western influence, but also seeing uh, the events, for instance, in Hong Kong um, and the, the March for Freedom there. Um, and it's remarkable, actually, in a sense that, well, Xi Jinping is going in this direction um, of, you know, going back to it, the communist mission. Um, but the thing is, is that whatever it tries to do in my uh, uh, boss at reaction, Ian Martin mentioned in his most mm. recent newsletter, is that China's influence is already in decline and with this announcement, and indeed for, uh, for the last several years, businesses uh, have been scared to invest basically in China. Um, and now you're seeing this demographic change as well and this social change happening uh, among different groups uh, happening in the country as well. I mean, China, Lucy, are taking brainwashing to a new level. This is what's so scary because in many ways you use the word revolution. It is a rerun of the Maoist revolution. Mm. But back then, Mao didn't have the luxury of social media, yeah. cyber surveillance, the kinds of things that Xi, President Xi does have. It isn't just celebrities, it's people that he regards as a threat. So Jack Ma, mm. the head of Alibaba, yeah. has kind of been cancelled, has yeah. not been seen really for the last nine months. Mm. His IPO for his company was cancelled, uh, just squashed completely. And most recently has been seen on what can only really be described as almost like hostage videos saying, oh, actually, I've seen the light and I'm now giving away a lot of my money to charity. Mm. Uh, so th this President Xi has given himself the title that Mao himself had. There's no getting away from the fact that Xi sees himself in that model, but he has so many more tools at his disposal. But the really interesting thing is, as, as Ian Martin was saying in, in that newsletter, is actually is and George Soros has talked a lot about this he, in the last 24 George hours as well, yeah. that actually actually is this going to really begin to see the decline of China because there are so many Western investors who are not going to want to be involved in this country anymore so where are they actually going to get some of their their economic powerhouse mm. from it's a worry isn't it because I mean it's a problem at the moment for the Chinese yeah. people but Mike it will be our problem eventually yeah um didn't Winston Churchill call the Soviet Union a riddle, enigma, mystery and all yes. that? Well, China's worse than that. Yeah. China, you said, is heading to be the wealthiest country in the world. Yeah. I don't think that will happen. I don't think that will happen because if you look at America and the GDP of America and the wealth of an individual American per head, mm. they are light years ahead of China, mm. where most of the wealth rest with 1% of the population. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so China has yeah. gr grinding yeah. poverty. Yeah, uh, absolutely grinding poverty. People are still in paddy fields picking rice out of the ground and all that kind of stuff, OK? But the real enigma with China is that they promote enormous wealth on one side hmm. and yet demand absolute faith to the state on the other. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. At some stage, the two can't coexist, can they? No. You, you, you know, you can't have a working model that keeps churning out more and more and more, like, uh, you know, the industrial age in Britain, mm. if the rules and regulations are getting tighter all the time. And, and this... China's the only country that's moving away from li liberalism, if you saw what I mean. Yes. You, know, yeah. we, you know, America... I mean, America is more liberal now than it was 30 years ago yeah. by a mile, you know, because that's the way attitudes in the West world are changing. In Texas on their abortion laws. Well, <laughs> I, I, I agree, but I'm thinking about California, where we've just been in this show, you know what I mean, where it gets liberal. But this, mm. this is... This, 
line here got me. Broadcasters must resolute, uh, resolutely put an end to sissy men. No, <laughs> I, I, I haven't yeah. heard now, the word... Now, this is another really uh, important story. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I haven't heard the word sissy, right, since... I was accused of being a sissy in the playground when I wore a pair of <laughs> glasses, you know, like Milky Bar Kid glasses. And I'd never heard that expression before. But this is what they're now saying. We've, our, our, you know, our image to the world now has got to be tougher, harder. Yes. We've got to look like we mean business, even if you're a broadcaster reading out the news. And, and that yeah. is complete state control. And complete state control will definitely definitely stop the bandwagon rolling of, you know, creative wealth, which has been but going on for the last three decades. should we be fearful? Three decades. Because, I mean, it's a nightmare for the people living there, and uh, yeah. we, we know about these sort of biometric passports Oh, oh we should definitely be fearful. I mean, yeah. they, they could invade Taiwan at any time. Yeah. And the moment they think that America are weak enough yeah. not to be able to resist, mm. the moment they see no threat from Russia or anybody else, they will invade Taiwan. Yes. We'll look at Hong they, Kong. I, 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 abs absolutely. I mean, I, I would say they... They are basically a very evilly cultured nation. Yeah. In, in, in and, sense and you worry of... that the, the most powerful nation on earth, yeah. with the deepest pockets, is not a democracy. That's the first time in centuries that's happened. Yeah, well, well that's what I mean. The, the, the complete contradiction between a communist policy politically mm -hmm. and, and a capitalist policy. Did you know that there are 12 cities in China as big as London, which none of us have ever heard of? Correct. You, yeah. ca you, cannot, you cannot imagine the expansion, the scope of China and how it's growing every day. 300 new coal-fired power stations mm -hmm. all underway and being built. Yeah. Just discovered billions and billions more tonnes of coal in Mongolia, where they go around oppressing people like everyone of their other regions. Yeah. This is going to give them unlimited world power. But the thing is with it is that that, makes, that baffles me is, is that they're turning back on the capitalist principles yeah. that made it the economic growth that we've but, seen but, over but, the last and under, 20, under Mao, who rejected yeah. any any yeah. idea of the market economy, they were absolutely stony exactly, broke. Exactly, yes. and and and, yeah. and and what you're seeing actually in China is there there is that they're at a stalemate basically is that they've got a declining workforce and clearly social life issues among certain members of the population are changing. And as we've seen um, in, in the West, there, there's a much more hostile reception um, to to Xi Jinping and China than we saw previously under the likes of um, David Cameron and Barack Obama. Mm. So I really do feel there's like a culture sh change going on here when it comes to our attitude to China and how it perceives itself what, among the global the thing elite. I, I understand about their philosophy mm. is that most countries like North Korea, who clamp down on their population brutally, is because the population are so poor and there's nothing there, and they fear that they will rebel, that they will all take up arms and, and attack the palace and, and, and topple the leader. The thing is, China's getting richer by the day, but the richer they get, the more oppressive they are to their yeah. own people. Yeah. I, 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 don't know, I don't know why, I don't know what they're trying to stave off, because you won't have revolution in China whilst the wealth is growing at the rate it's growing now. So what are they yeah. trying to stop? And, of course, they're investing heavily in Africa and oh, Asia massively. in order to get their hands on, uh, you know, precious minerals and resources. Massively. They're but building they infrastructure, really they're hideously... lending money they, to yeah. poor regimes in order to have long-term control. So they have a declining birth rate. Mm. It's something like 1.3, where it should be... I think uh, to, keep your, to keep it stable, it should be 1.8. Mm. So I think looking ahead, they're very worried that they're actually going to have people, that they're not going to be able to sustain the standard of living for the people who are, who are actually in the country. Mm. And unfortunately, this, it's a, a, a real, almost like a messiah complex with President Xi, that it's all about protecting his power. It's not about whether the country Tom's survives. Party. It's not yeah. even about the party, course, it's about yeah. protecting yeah. him. Yes. Look at and, show it, and it always felt. was the party, uh, but of course now he's focused he on now, that. He now feels he's bigger than the and party. And he's got a job for mm. life and it's very concerning. But this is an impotent conversation because there's nothing we can do about no, it. No, nothing. Mm. Uh, absolutely nothing. I mean, militarily, they're, they're miles away from America. America have got 18 aircraft carriers, China have got one. Mm. So it'll take them an awful long time to, to get up to speed on that. But eventually, if they keep going like this, the other, the other thing that we've touched upon mm. is that whilst China are getting more and more powerful and bigger and bigger, America are declining. Yeah. America are declining. And if America now go down the Biden route of, um, you know, America home, 
Yeah. America don't want influence anymore around the world. Doesn't that leave the gap open for somebody else to come in and take over? And also, America's national debt is absolutely colossal. And, and a lot China, of it's owned by China. China own a lot of that yeah. debt. So yeah. it could be that there doesn't need to be a physical yeah. war because they'll win the absolutely. economic one. Absolutely. Well, you're absolutely right about Africa. Every time they see an opportunity, they go to an African country that's got a coastline and volunteer to build them a dock. And the reason they do that is, of course, they want to expert all their, you know, natural mineral resources. But they then take over the country. It then becomes, you know, like a, a colony of China without them actually invading it. And, of course, uh, this plays out into sort of geopolitics yep. because uh, the Taliban have announced that their greatest ally now is China. China. Yeah. 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 Which is not very encouraging, is it? No. If I was Australian, I'd be pretty worried, you know, mm. because if you think about it, you know, that is a situation which is almost impossible to defend. Well, New Zealand, uh, uh, one who's been, been very sympathetic, if I can say so myself, towards China. Yes. And if you think yeah. New Zealand and uh, how much of a strong relationship it has with the UK in yes. regards to the whole Commonwealth. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's very yes. concerning. And you just look at the... It's made in, that whole Five Eyes relationship really... Has, yeah, completely. Has, yeah. But just look at how much influence, like, Chinese company and China have mm. on universities and businesses. Yeah. And, and they mm. obviously they tried to do the 5G network with Huawei and it yeah. took um, Boris Johnson to do a U-turn yeah. on it before, yeah. before it. And it's mm. been happening for so many years now oh. that it's kind of impossible to kind of revert back to well, because I, they've already made it. Well, I live down on market. the coast uh, near Portsmouth, right. About one third of Portsmouth University is now Chinese students. And they're so keen to get them there, they're now chartering planes to bring Chinese students in to fill the vacancies in English universities. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're absolutely right, because the Chinese have got money that nobody else in the world at the moment has. Indeed, so how do you solve a problem like China? GB views at gbnews.uk. Now, here's another story for you, and this is quite fascinating. Fiona Bruce has been in the media spotlight, and it's in relation to how much time children spend with their nannies. Fiona Bruce admitted that she's questioned how much time that she spent with her own children, saying she feels every working woman has had the same struggle. The newsreader who recently returned to Question Time has two children opening up about having a live-in nanny for 20 years. Fiona said, did I spend enough time with my children? I think that if you scratch the surface of any working woman, she will always think probably not. Is it an issue, do you think, Bill, the idea of other people raising your kids? No, I don't think it's a problem in the slightest. I mean, from my experience, my, my mum was an air hostess or used to be an air hostess. Mm. Um, which meant a lot of my time had to be in, when I wasn't in school or wasn't at after school club or breakfast club was being raised by uh, a babysitter or... or was the or, manual. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that's not so much a problem, but the problem there is, is that nannies can't replace, like, the, the emotional love and the... And the care that you would get from from a mother, and I do sympathise a little. I bit. Pay, do you to... think you paid the price a little bit for? Um, I well, mean, I'm sure your mum uh, did a lovely job, <laughs> but if she was away a lot, did, did did you miss her? Did you pine for her? Well, to an extent, but um, that changed obviously when she changed jobs and she became a teacher, um, yeah. primarily so she could spend more time with us. Um, yeah. Did she but... bribe you with uh, those tiny little packets of peanuts? <laughs> <laughs> no, she was a she was a strict mum, very strict. Did she bring this washing, bring... washing up dishes that like? Did Five, she, six did years she give old. you like a hot towel before dinner? Or <laughs> no, I, she, I hope she swiped a few bottles of grog off the plane. <laughs> well, exactly. Now you're talking. <laughs> a couple of Pinot Grigios. Exactly. Um, but no, no, she was a wonderful mum, and of um, and uh, I think that with this, uh, we do need to maybe be understanding. And I have some fear. And like Fiona Bruce is obviously an incredibly busy woman. Sure. Um, you know, By her own do, choice. Do back then doing the the, the yeah. evening news and now during question time. It's well, Mike, is she selfish? No, I don't think she's selfish at all. What I'm saying is that some women make that decision in life and have to use nannies. I'm incredibly sympathetic to women who decide to make a career plan and go for it and have to rely on nannies. Mm. During my career, when I've run organisations, newsrooms or programming floors, yeah. I've always been sympathetic if somebody's come to me and said, I've got to go home, I've got a problem with my nanny. Mm. And it's happened a lot during the course of my professional life, you know. Yeah. 
And if a woman in this country wants to make it to the top, and I always use my old Fleet Street colleague Eve Pollard as an example, oh, yes. you know what I mean? Yeah. Smash through that glass window, get up there, want to do it. They will have to rely on people to look after their children if they, if they want to. Philippa Kennedy is another friend of mine, OK? And I remember Philippa, you know, always having to worry about the nannies and all that. So I'm incredibly sympathetic. What, what I would say in this Fiona Bruce story is she said, oh, you know, and then revealed she'd had the same nanny for 20 years. Mm. That is a miracle, because in my experience, <laughs> the biggest problem that, that, that professional women have is losing their nannies about every nine or 12 months when they get a better offer from a, a bigger house or they go back to Sweden or And something. even better yeah. to have a yeah. live-in nanny because yes. then she's part of the family. Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah so but, but I would you're the expert here. I would disagree with this idea that somehow that you don't get love from a nanny, that mm. you do, because I think those Not the same bonds... Way as a mother. Well, mm. yeah, but, but, well, in my clinical experience, not all mothers like their children mm -hmm. and not all children feel loved by their parents. So that, that just isn't necessarily true. In many cases, some people do feel a stronger bond to their nanny, partly perhaps because they spent so much more time with that mm. person. But I think the idea that you have a child and you bring your best self to your parenting role, for some women, that means by going out to work. That means by actually having something else that makes them feel not just a mum, not just a woman, not necessarily just a wife or a partner, but someone who's got a career or someone who's making a difference, working mm. for a charity, running, yeah. you know, running a company or whatever it might be, t being a teacher, mm. that actually that is that enables them to be a better mum. Yeah. Uh, so even though they're not necessarily there for the quantity of hours in the day, mm. maybe the quality time that they have with their kids mm. is improved by that dynamic. Could I ask, what, what do you think about um, this idea of working from home? There's a lot of talk about um, the switch away from in the office and potentially mm. mothers might be at home more and to spend time with their children. Do you think that could have potential benefits with this discussion around um, not being there for their children? Well, I think, again, it would be, it's very, clear that when you are working from home and you've got children in the mix the chances are it's your work that's going to suffer because somehow your children are that pull and you have to mm. spend more time with them so i think unfortunately some some mothers would actually relish the chance to go back into the office because mm. it gives you that demarcation mm. line yeah. of being saying this is who i am in the workplace totally and this is who i am in the domestic setting you know, uh, answering the phone with the baby in your arms and all that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah isn't it? i mean you know, for every do, you enchanting yeah. zoom call that we've all seen where a child kind of piles onto yeah. your lap and that's very endearing you do that for 12 months and you just know that your work is going to suffer mm. so i think uh, actually nannies are worth their weight in gold you should have william yeah. reese mogg on the show shouldn't you am yes. i not right in thinking <laughs> yeah, that he, he took his to nanny say. campaigning on the campaign yes. trail with him yeah. she's been yeah. with him so long that's right in, in fact yeah. i think that it was jacob reese mogg mm. uh, with the nanny who now is the nanny to his, his children. that's children. right yes absolutely. And, yeah. and she's that's definitely how close they are like a family. member of the family it doesn't always play out like though does it yeah. uh, in that way but i do agree with you lucy that the idea actually is that mum should actually put herself first and if she's sort of emotionally and professionally fulfilled she'll probably be a better mum rather than staying at home bitter and twisted but grinding out the hours coming to see me in therapy domestic, exactly yeah domestic it's, chores. The, it's that classic kind of you know oxygen mask in the airplane you have to fit that on yourself first in order to be able to yeah. help your child to, to fit it there or, or maybe you know an elderly person in the seat next to you similarly at home you you cannot show up as a good parent if you yourself are frustrated or resentful in any way mm. and unfortunately there was a generation of women uh, and perhaps arguably I was raised by that generation who were on the cusp of being able to have career success, mm. but th there was quite a lot of stigma and, and missed opportunities. And I think my generation said, we are never going to let that happen to us. We are actually going to make the life that we want to have. And as a result of that, there are going to be other choices that need to be made mm. in terms of raising kids. Were you raised by babysitters or nannies or other members of the family or friends? Let me know what your experience has been, gbviews at gbnews.uk. I certainly was passed from uh, random auntie to auntie, which was joyful and indeed more or less strangers as well, friends of my parents because they were both very busy. And I've got to say that it gave me a, a lifelong curiosity about people and I've always found people to be uh, very approachable perhaps because I was exposed to so many people when I was growing up but what's your experience at gbviews at gbnews.uk a Banksy painting 
that partially shredded itself after being sold at auction is going back under the hammer with a guide price almost six times higher than the original sale. The subversive street artist stunned the art world when his girl with balloon attempted to self-destruct in London in 2018, immediately after the conclusion of the auction. A collector had the top bid at 1.1 million pounds. So basically what happened is you've got this painting, it's being sold, and then once it's sold, it actually kind of starts to descend and gets shredded as people watched in horror. I mean, this is remarkable, Lucy, isn't it? It, it was a very astonishing piece of footage. You actually yeah. watch it live. Uh, because, yeah, you've got the auctioneer who kind of bangs the gavel down. It's 1.1 million. And then literally, automatically, the, the painting slides. But it does make the question, you know, what is art? Yes. Because that is now, as you said, it's now going for kind of six times the price because there's a whole backstory to it. There's a novelty mm. to it. It's a one-off. You're buying... You are buying, literally, a, a, I suppose, a priceless work of art. It's got a price on it, but because it's never been done and will never be done again, it is a unique entity. But does that make it art? And no, it's, it's only it's... what you're prepared to pay for it. Exactly. I could do a doodle oh. and put it in a frame, and if I told you that it was by Banksy, you'd be no. like, oh, I've got to buy it. The, the, the modern art world is funded and has been promoted by people who are completely bonkers. <laughs> people who go around buying a an unmade bed, and then suddenly <laughs> tell you it's art. I mean, it's just madness, complete madness. But as you quite rightly say, if somebody's stupid enough to decide to and buy that and, 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 and then it becomes mine. The latest one, you know, which is going to be fascinating, is Charlie Bit My Finger, right? The now, video. Yeah, now, Charlie Bit My Finger, the video, yeah. sold, and it's been seen millions of times around the for world. Thousands but, of pounds. For thousands of pounds. Hundreds of thousands hundreds of dollars. Thousands. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's been seen all around the world millions of times, but somebody who's rich enough wanted to own it. So that when you go round to this person's house and you're having a cocktail party and all that, he can <laughs> flick it on the screen and say, would you like to see Charlie bit my finger? <laughs> oh, no, I've got it on my phone. You haven't. Once he's bought it, bang, it comes <laughs> off YouTube and it's yours. Now, that is now the latest form of art. That's where the art money's going next. Who knew? Well, listen, we'll discuss a lot more after this. My panel are going to nominate their Greatest Britain and Union Jackass, plus more stories to come as well. See you shortly. <laughs> but still with me, uh, Mike, and also Bill and Lucy as well. And let's talk about our next story. And uh, I think this one is uh, rather interesting. It impacts lots of people. Apple has indefinitely delayed the rollout of controversial child safety features following a furious backlash from its users. The contentious plans revealed by the tech giant in early August involve scanning iPhones for child abuse images and reporting flagged owners to the police. It had planned to roll out the feature for iPhones, iPads and Mac computers with software updates later in the year in America. But uh, what do you think about this bill? Because the bottom line is that we all want to see paedophiles caught and these evil crimes uh, become impossible. But do you want someone scanning the contents of your iPhone? Well, it's really interesting in the sense that many of the complaints about this new measure um, for Apple devices, and I, I myself have an iPhone and a Mac as well, so it will affect me and indeed millions, if not like billions of people, um, is that we're already being scanned security-wise and constantly watched because in the UK and indeed in the West, there's this like Hobbesian conception where by we sacrifice almost our freedom from you know privacy um, in order to protect, pe protect um, people. Yeah. And in this case, it's against um, those that are committing um, terrible acts like uh, child abuse, for instance. And many people have highlighted not only the, the flaws uh, of the police uh, and also companies as well. So often uh, there's a genre of uh, video on YouTube and also popular on Facebook of these um, paedophile hunters, they're called. Uh, one of them actually went to my um, old secondary school. And uh, they basically pretend to be a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old girl mm -hmm. uh, on a dating app of some sort, like Tinder. Um, and then they'll start messaging these people and then arranging meetups and then having cameras ready for the moment that yes. the police will arrive and start arresting them. So I think 
Apple could work to make this measure better and they're going to be review it, reviewing it mm. and they hope to mm. still do it. But I feel if it's going to, it needs to be in consultation with the police because it's really them, not social media companies, private companies that should be deciding um, the fate of people going into prison or not. Well, we've seen a land grab of our civil liberties in the course of the pandemic. Amazon planned to be more proactive about removing websites and services from its cloud computing platform, AWS, which is used by the likes of Netflix, Fox and ITV. A new team of experts will monitor and remove websites and services in violation of its terms of service, including those promoting violence, Reuters first reported. But the question is, Lucy, whether this infringes our freedom to look at some stuff that a tech billionaire thinks is inappropriate. Yeah, because they've got so much market share that mm. basically this is censoring the internet. Yeah. And at some point... And they, they decide what's good and bad. Yeah, but, but only they decide. Mm. They're not leaving it up to our own judgment or they're not leaving it up to our capacity to think one thing and then change our mind, that actually we're being controlled. So it's not just the, the content that they're controlling, but actually it's almost like our thought processes that are going to be controlled because yes. we're not going to have access to that material to be able to make a decision. Because we can't, be, we can't be trusted with it. It'll, yeah. it'll, it'll somehow pollute our minds. So there's an infantilization that's going on, which is really quite yeah. disturbing because, again, it's a kind of big brother, all powerful, we know better than you. Mm -hmm. But at the same time... What is the alternative? Because there is really heinous material out there. There is really disgusting, disturbing material. And do we want that? There's the grey area. Where, who, who should actually police this? Mm. Because it surely isn't right that there are snuff videos, that there are yeah. videos of beheadings. It can't be right that that material is available to a 14 year old child who's just a little bit more tech savvy than the average person. Mm -hmm. So where are we going to police that? How are we going to police that? Of course, but, Mike, you spent decades in print media and, yeah, well, and you know, exactly. you're, you're a journalist, a seeker of, you know, truth, truth and, and justice. justice. That's right. Uh, it's a worry, isn't it, for, well, for, for somebody else to make a judgment about what we should read and see? Well, it's a worry for me because I'm a complete technophobe. So I see it in black and white terms and I see it in this term. Ah. I see pornographic, filthy material, and the manufacturers want to remove it. Mm. I would say, yes, of course, it should be removed. But being a technophobe, the next question is, hang on, if they can actually identify that sort of material on people's phones, what else can they identify? What else yes. can they decide upon? What else are they able to access? What about somebody who leaves Apple and goes freelance somewhere else would he then start working in the access of people's bank accounts? Well, That's we're right. now seeing and, it with and, potentially and, vaccine passports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, you know. And, and so I would like to try and work it from the other end of the telescope mm. and make it more difficult to load this stuff up onto these systems yeah. rather than having to find it and get rid of it when it's there. Now, don't ask me how that's done. Mm. As I say, I'm a complete <laughs> technophobe. But there must be a way to do that. There must be a way of, you know, making... I don't know, invent a new, you know, in the old days when we had televisions, they were 625 lines or 405 lines or something like that. Can't different levels of applications going into telephones be devised? I don't know, though. I wonder whether you leave well alone and understand that there will be evil people out there yeah. and there will be evil material. Yes. But the price, you pay, the price you pay for filtering that is freedom of speech, freedom of thought. Mm. And also, because you, you, the first uh, example you mentioned was porn. Well, I happen to yeah. think that there's quite a lot of really good porn out there. There's mm -hmm. enjoyable porn. Right. But it's now Perhaps got this umbrella to... <laughs> 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 I, I, right, yeah. I just by the way, to have some here. Yeah, you'll have to get his um, phone working first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I just think that just, uh, just even in that yeah. example, <laughs> you, get a, you get a sense of, of the divide yeah. where you think it might be a bad thing and I think it's really great because some of it's yeah. made by women and it's really beautiful and tasteful. Mm. So, again... It's where is the judgment that we're not being allowed to actually have a judgment about the content that we're seeing? Mm. It's just remarkable. And um, Jamie Bartlett, who used to be at Demos, a, a journalist, he wrote about this in a book called The, uh, the People Versus Tech, of how the fact that just uh, these tech companies, Google, Amazon, um, Apple, have become just as powerful, if not more powerful, than most nation states yeah. Yeah. in not yeah. only deciding what one can say on the mm. internet, mm. but also when it comes potentially with this of uh, tracking down uh, 
potential yeah. paedophiles as well. Mm. Um, and as we saw, although it wasn't a decisive factor when it came to it, but how they can also influence elections as yeah. well. It's remarkable just and actually kind of terrifying to see. And these yeah. guys yeah. aren't elected no, either. In the, in like and they provide cameras. a lot of the technology for CCTV cameras around the world that yeah. all link up to each other. So, in fact, it's it's total big brothers. Well, we've seen it on Twitter and Facebook yeah. that if you share a, a tweet or a video mm. that cast doubt on the efficacy of lockdowns or face coverings, mm. it gets kind of flagged as yeah. controversial or yeah. possible misinformation. Do you want to read this article first before you tweet it yeah. when you often get it on Twitter? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Even though it might be my article. For mm. Mm. <laughs> Well, indeed. Uh, well, that's always worth reading. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's time now for this. It's time now for my panel to reveal their greatest Britain and union jackass. Lucy, let me start with you. Who is your greatest Britain? Well, at the moment, my greatest Britain is the Queen. Yes. Not least Very because good. in the last yeah. couple of days, she has actually yeah. had to deal with yet another mm. assault on her privacy, yes. assault on her... Uh, you know, the sense of... She's 94, 95. 95. And we now know all of the arrangements that are going to happen when she dies. And it's almost as if we're rubbing salt into the wound to kind of remind her, you know, this is coming up soon, this is what we're all going to be doing. Why does she need to be reminded of that? Mm. I just, I thought the whole thing was, uh, I mean, absolutely gripping, fascinating information, particularly about the, um, you know, the running up, the running down of the flags at number 10 and the fact that they haven't got someone necessarily in place to do it, in which case I could volunteer because mm -hmm. I don't live that far away. Um, <laughs> if they do need someone, mm. just saying. Mm. Uh, but, you know, why, why does she have to go through this? She's had so many... Well, Harry and Meghan in particular, we, yes. we know, has, have perhaps caused her a little bit of grief this year. Mm. She's lost her husband I, and she's so stoic and she's just always Marvel been woman. there. And I, yeah, she is my favourite Briton. Yeah, she could be our greatest Briton every night. Ever, ever. Yeah. Mike Perry. Yeah, my uh, greatest Briton is Wing Commander Kev Latchman of 99 Squadron. And he flew one of the last aeroplanes out of Kabul. And as he's careering down the runway, uh, a group of vehicles suddenly appear at the end of the runway. They just started driving across the runway. Mm -hmm. One of them was a, uh, a bus, I believe, and he had two choices. He could either have put his foot down and tried to get that plane off the air, clear the bus, or he could have slammed the brakes on. Had he slammed the brakes on, he'd have saved the passengers who were behind him in the plane, taking refugees to safety, but he'd have smashed into the vehicles and killed all them. So he put his foot down, lifted the lever, boom, and he cleared the bus by 10 feet. Remarkable. And then, and then got out into the atmosphere and got those people back into Europe. Brilliant nomination. Mm. <laughs> follow that, Bill. Oh, I don't know if I can follow that at all. But uh, my greatest <laughs> Britain, um, it's, kind of, it's a sweet story, though. It's uh, a guy called Gordon Short. Um, he's a World War II veteran, so he served during, during the war against the Nazis. Um, and he has just completed uh, 100 rounds of bowls for his 100th birthday. Oh, uh, and brilliant. he's raised, I think, mm. nearly £5,000 uh, for the Devon uh, Air Ambulance Service. So, mm. really lovely story. Ah, I love oh, that story, Captain nice. Tom Moore in the making. How about your union jackass? We already mentioned them, but I'd have to give it to the FA um, mm. for their decision. And frankly, yeah. uh, they should just be looking to the abuse that the uh, players like Raheem Sterling sure. experienced in yeah. Hungary and yeah. trying to solve um, inequality within grassroots football as well. Yeah. So Not going yeah. after the tweets of a footballer who was a bit foolish when he was 14 years Four, of age. Year nine. Yeah. Year, year nine. Year nine. There you go. Yeah. Um, it's been really nice talking about Mark Bowler and a very talented footballer and we wish him well. How about you, Lucy, your union jackass? It's Sir Ian McKellen, uh, who is a bit of a theatrical hero of mine, but sure. then suddenly announced that he was doing Hamlet 82. aged 82. <laughs> I mean, how ridiculous. Mm. Uh, slight, I don't know whether it's a narcissistic thing, I don't know whether it's a lovey thing. I did go and see the production and, and the moment where he speaks to the skull in yeah. Act 5, Alas Poor Yorick, that famous speech, um, that's actually quite poignant to have an 82-year-old reflecting on mortality. Mm. And, but the rest of it, I was like, oh, please, just give it to someone who's, you know, Hamlet's 28 mm. yeah. at mm. the max. Mm. Fair point. Good shout. Uh, how about you, your union jackass with the clock against us, Mike Parry? Yes, OK, very quickly. Uh, two people sharing the crown, Patrick Harvey and Lorna Slater, joint leaders of the Scottish Greens, who've now just entered into a coalition with Nicola Sturgeon yes. of the SNP. And, listen, they're in touch with their policies, but one policy they pursue is a shift from economic growth. 
OK, let's all go back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> Come on, let's all have horses and carts. You know, let's all use hammers <laughs> instead of drills. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I love it, and you're quite right. I do worry uh, for how that's going to play out politically for the people of Scotland. Thank you so much to my amazing panel, uh, Lucy, Bill and Mike.